Father Yahuwah, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. And Father, we just ask that you be here with us in this study this morning. Help us to give us knowledge and understanding so that, or knowledge and wisdom so that we can have understanding. And Father, we just ask that you just watch over, guide, and direct us. Keep us safe and protect us. And Father, we just pray that everything that we say and do here today is to glorify and to magnify you. All this we ask and pray in Yahushua's name. Amen. Okay, so today I want to kind of get off the beaten track. I guess we were studying in the book of John, but one of the things I want to go through today, I want to go through Acts chapter 10. And because uh, this has got some really important stuff that uh, is very much misinterpreted in the major Christian denominations and religions. So uh, I guess what we'll do is I'll, we'll just start here in Acts chapter 10. It says there was a certain man in Caesarea called, called Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Itali Italian regiment, a devout man and one who fears Elohim with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to Elohim always. Now, what I wanna bring out this uh, Cornelius, it says that he's a centurion, meaning that he's a Roman soldier and of the Italian regiment. Now, it, he's from Italy and part of the Italy or Italian army, and his name is Cornelius, which is Latin. And so uh, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's a Latin from the, you know, the around Italy, but he's doing his work or stationed, if you will, there in uh, the area of Israel or in Jerusalem in that, in that area. So, uh, but now one of the things I want to bring out, it says that he is a devout man and one who feared Elohim with all his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed to Elohim always. Okay, even though he was considered here a Gentile, he's making the change from, from being a Gentile to being Israel, okay? Because he is praying to Yahuwah and he is a, dever, a very devout man, okay? And here in a little bit later, you'll see, I'll read it, it's down a little bit lower, but it says that he was respected by all the Jews. Okay, now for him to be respected by the Jews, he would have to be Torah obedient. And he would have to be eating clean. He would have to be observing the feast days. He'd have to be doing all that was required in the Torah. Otherwise, he would not be uh, respected by the other Jews. But at the same time, he was an Italian. And, he, and, and the way that the rabbinical Judaism works is that if someone is a Gentile, then no matter what they think or believe, they're unclean. Okay, now that's the way the rabbinical Judaism, that's the, that's what the, the rabbis taught, you know, that were, uh, you know, they're in the temple at the time. And like I said, a lot of these rabbis were appointed by the Roman government and they were, uh, you know, they were illegitimate as far as being Levitical priests. They were not Levitical. They were, they were something else. And they, a lot of the priests were, you know, like I said, they were, they were not legitimate Levitical priest. And another thing I want to bring out, and this is just so you kind of know, but the word, uh, it says he was from uh, Caesarea. Well, Caesarea, just it, it's a, 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 a Greek word for Caesar. And so the town was named after Caesar, but, uh, you know, there, there where he was living. And then, you know, a lot of times, you know, we look past a lot of these names and these names you know, as we found out with the lineage of Yahusha, that the names really are critical in knowing. But we we have a tendency to blow by these names, these city names and these people names. And when we do, we miss a really in-depth uh, understanding of what it's actually, uh, what the scripture actually says. So, so here now we've got this guy named Cornelius and his family. <clears throat> They're living in Caesarea and they're very devout. They, they follow Yahuwah. They, they, they obey the Torah. Okay, in verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of Elohim coming and in and saying to him, Cornelius. Now, I just want to stop right there for a second. Okay, so just so you know, the ninth hour, 
So straight up uh, noon would be the sixth. The ninth hour would be three hours later, which would be uh, about three o'clock or three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. So, uh, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, master? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before Yahuwah. Now send men to Yapa and send for Shimon, whose name is Kepa. He is lodging with Shimon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among uh, those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Yapa. Okay, then here is the part that I want to really focus on. And this is Peter's vision. Okay, the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Kepa went up onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they, uh, while they made ready, he fell into a trance or he fell asleep and saw heaven open up like an object with a great sheet bound at four corners, descending on him and let down to the earth. In it were, uh, were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild, creeping, wild beasts, creeping things and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, had rise, uh, Kepa, kill and eat. Okay, now you got to understand what's going on here. Okay, so Peter, it says right there very clearly, Kepa, that he went up on the housetop to rest and he was waiting on people to fix his meal because he was hungry. Well, when he had this vision, he was hungry. Okay, and Yahuwah used this vision to help teach him to teach him something that that uh, that normally Kepa would not have been part of. Okay, so when he told Peter, when he told Kepa to kill and eat, you have to understand that it was looking at unclean things. And so uh, when when Kepa when he saw this, he he answered in verse fourteen. It says, "But he said." Not so, uh, uh, master, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, uh, what Yahuwah has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken back up into heaven again. Okay, now, if you'll notice Kepa's reaction to him being told to kill and eat. Okay, he said, no. He said, Anything, you know, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Okay, so you got to understand where Kepa's coming from. And so if you go back into Deuteronomy, and there's, uh, I think it's in uh, chapter 16, it talks about the false prophets. And Kepa knows that if anyone comes teaching any other thing other than Torah, then you have to consider them a false prophet. And he knew that this was uh, a Malachim or an angel of Yahuwah that, or, you know, he's dealing with here. And so uh, when, uh, when he saw this, he saw this vision, then he knew that something wasn't right. Okay, so he knew that Yahuwah would never tell him to do anything that violated Torah. And here again, we at the same time need to understand the same thing. Yahuwah will never tell you to do anything that violates the scripture, violates his word. Okay, so now Kepa, Peter, is in a quandary. He doesn't really understand exactly what's going on here, okay? And so uh, let's see, we're in verse 17 now. And it says, now while Peter was wondering within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, a man, the men whom, uh, let's see, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry for Shimon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Shimon, whose uh, surname was Kepa, uh, was lodged there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Ruach or the spirit said to him, behold, three men are, see are seeking you. Arise therefore, 
uh, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Okay, so now he's being told to go with these guys and to doubt nothing. And so then it goes on, it says, then Peter went down to the men uh, who had been sent to him from Cornelius and, and said, yes, I am whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one who fears all of him and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by the holy Malachim, by the, 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 the Kadosh or holy Malachim or angel, to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. Okay, now here's where I was talking about a while ago. It says that uh, he had a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews and was divinely instructed by the Kadosh Malachim or the, the holy angel to summon you to, the, to his house. Okay, now again, Cornelius was considered a Gentile because he was Italian. He was a, 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 a Latin Italian. And Latins and Italians both are considered Gentiles. But now understand this. He has already made his uh, profession of faith in to Yahuwah, and he's, he's, he's lining himself up with the Torah. So he's, he, he's done just like what we have. We were raised Gentile. Cornelius was raised Gentile. He migrated into this belief system, this walk just like we have. Okay, Cornelius at this point was not considered a Gentile because a Gentile is someone that is not in covenant. We were raised as Gentiles. We were raised not in covenant. We have since then become to the knowledge and the understanding that we are to keep the Torah and have Yahusha as Messiah. So now we are no longer uh, Gentile. We are we are the Yahudim, or we are a Jew, okay? Now, this is the same thing that, that Cornelius is dealing with, okay? Now, we all had different ways of coming into this belief system, into this walk. Just, It's not just like what Cornelius is, but it's something similar. It's something that somebody that we knew that had invited us to a meeting or our reading and understanding changed, our studies changed looked at things different, changed. However, we came into this walk, we know that Yahuwah has led us into this walk. Okay. And uh, let's see, uh, it goes on. It says, on the next day, Kepa went, went away with them and, and some brethren from Yapa accompanied him. Okay, now, and the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and, clo and close friends. As Kepa was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Kepa lifted him up saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. As, and as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, you know, how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or to go in or to go to one of another nation, uh, okay, to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But Yahuwah has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent me? Okay, now this right here is vitally important and you better get a you better put your hooks in this little answer right here this little piece because this is the this is the most important part okay so here you see Kepa he's meeting Cornelius for the first time Cornelius falls down and says that you know that he's worshiping him and this is something that I can fully understand because I mean I, the people that brought me into this I feel the same way about them for the most part Okay, but here's what you got to know. It says uh, that the rabbinical Jews say that it's unlawful for uh, a Yahudim or the Jews to associate with Gentiles because they are unclean. But what he, but what did Yahuwah 
teach Keppa. When he let that bed sheet down and told Keppa to kill and eat, he was not talking about food. Food has nothing to do with this, with this story here. Because Yahuwah showed, it says that, but, but Elohim has showed me, now this is Keppa talking, that I should not call any man common or unclean. And you got to get that nailed down. Because when you, when you see Peter's vision and you see the bed sheet with all the unclean things in it, and that says slay or kill and eat, it is not talking about killing and eating unclean food. It has nothing to do with food. This was a vision that Peter, that Kepa received, and it was meant to be confusing because at, what it did is it caused Kepa to think. And he knew he was basically being challenged here. He knew that what he was being told was not, the, you know, what was not the way that it was. But when he finally figured it out, or the angel of Malachim, when they finally told him what this was about, then it all made sense. You are not to call any man unclean. Okay. So when we look at people, we should never judge their, them as a person. In other words, you don't look at someone based on their nationality, their race, their color, their, you know, the way they dress, the way they smell, the way, you know, we should never make a judgment on people based on that. Now, we are to make judgments based on the way that they act. Okay. And and we don't we don't make a judgment as to whether or not they're they're going to be saved. Now we know that if they're not in covenant, we will be able to tell if they're in covenant or not. Now we've got to be careful in dealing with people that are not in covenant. Okay. Because what if someone not in covenant falls on hard times? You know, one of the things that we want to do is we want to go out and we want to help them, even though they're not in covenant. Well, scripture tells us to be real careful about that because it may be that they're not in covenant, and they're wrestling with Yahuwah, and Yahuwah takes them down to a very low point to where they have no other way to turn but back to him. And he does that a lot of times. He'll take somebody, and he'll, he'll, he'll break them down, and he will get them to where that, you know, they have nothing, and they, all, they have to turn back to him or stick a gun in their mouth, for instance. So, and there's a lot of people that go ahead, and, 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 and they will kill themselves because they've hit rock bottom and they don't know where to go. But that's the ones that Yahuwah is not dealing with so much, I think. And, but now if Yahuwah is dealing with them, then they will know that, that their only hope of salvation is in Yahuwah. So if we go and, and try to bail them out of their, their misery and their heartache, it may be getting in the way of Yahuwah. So we have to be careful about these things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't help people. Don't get me wrong here. But I am saying that, you know, that if, if Yahuwah is working on them, then we need to be careful and not get in his way. But uh, here, we don't call any person unclean because, it, like I said, it may be that Yahuwah is trying to get them to turn and, and, and come to him. And then it goes on. It says, so Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And I said, or, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of Yahuwah. Send therefore to Yapa and call Shimon here, whose, name, whose surname is Kepa. He is lodging in the house of Shimon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before Yahuwah to hear all the things commanded you by Elohim. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, okay, now it will, let me finish this. It says, in truth, I perceive that Elohim shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him or, and works righteousness is accepted by him. Okay. Now here's another confirmation that of what, you know, Kepa's vision was. Now, when it says in truth, we have to know that that truth that it's talking about is the Torah. Okay, so we can reword this. Okay, in the Torah, 
I perceive that Yahuwah shows no partiality. So it doesn't matter where these people come from, who they are, where they, you know, it doesn't matter. So we should not show partiality. And Yahuwah does not show partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Okay, so we know that the, the, the fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of wisdom. You cannot gain wisdom without the fear of Yahuwah. Yahuwah not only can kill you, but he can destroy you and cast you away forever. And you better have fear that he can do that. Because if you're not following his ways, that's what's going to happen. He will destroy you and cast you away forever. Okay. And works, and this, whoever it is that fears him and works righteousness. Again, this is one of those terms that we have to, we have to get nailed down. It's Deuteronomy 6.25. And it says that this is our righteousness that we observe and do all that is written in the book of the Torah. So those that fear Yahuwah and that keep the Torah will be accepted by him. Now, one of the things that you have to also understand is the Torah. Okay, so Yahusha, Hamashiach, the Messiah, is the living Torah. So you can't say that I believe in Yahusha or I believe in Jesus and you're not keeping the Torah. Then what First John says is that if you're a liar and the truth's not in you, okay? So you're keeping, you're, you're, you're believing or you have a head knowledge in a man named Jesus and you're putting your faith that Jesus is going to save you, but yet you're not keeping the Torah, then I don't know. You're, you're, you're being very deceived. Okay, now uh, we know that the name Jesus is only about, I don't know, four or 500 years old at the oldest. If you look at the, the original King James Bible that was written in 1611, his name in that Bible is spelled I-E-S-U-S. -S. That's how it's actually spelled. And it's pronounced, it's a, it's a Greek word and it's pronounced Yeshua. <clears throat> but then as later translations of the Greek Bible or the, the, the King James Bible came along, it, it went from I-E-S-U-S -S to J-E-S-U-S, -S, and that's where the name Jesus come from. Well, the name Jesus, like I said, is not but just, I mean, it, it's late, it came along later than 1611, 1600 years after Yahusha, and in 1611, his name was Yeshua. It was said a little bit different because in the in the Greek language, there's no there's no Y sound. It's an it's an e, double E kind of sound. It's Yeshua is kind of the way that it, they 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 pronounce it, but it's still the same name. It's the best that they that they can work with on how to say it. But the word the the there is no J's in the in the Hebrew language. There's no soft G's. So, you know, the word Jesus would never exist in the Hebrew. And uh, so anyway, long story short, uh, you know, we, uh, we get, we're deceived by a lot of the, the, the newer uh, writings. Okay, so uh, here, you know, it says that, uh, that, you know, he that fears Yahuwah and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which Yahuwah sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Yeshua HaMashiach. So the word, again, is Yeshua HaMashiach. He is Elohim of all. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from uh, Galilee after the baptism, which Yehuchanan, or John, preached, how Elohim anointed Yahusha of Nazareth, okay, of Nazareth, with the Ruach Kodesh, or the Holy Spirit, and with power, who, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for Yahuwah uh, was with him. Now, you know, one of the things I do want to bring up here, uh, let me mark my spot right quick so I don't lose it. One of the things I want to bring up right quick is, you know, if you go into Matthew, it talks about you know, that uh, 
that we'll do greater things than what the disciples did. You know, and they talked about bringing people back from the dead and, and healing the blind and, and things of that nature. Well, I want you to think about this just a minute. How many people, well, the people that are listening to this video right now, okay? If you were in Christianity and not following the Torah, then you were dead, spiritually dead. And if you're following Torah now, and you have the faith that Yahushua was the Messiah, then you have been brought to life. So have we brought people from the dead back to life? Yes, absolutely. Now, have people that have not seen what we're teaching, have we healed the blind? Yes, we have healed the blind. So what, what, what it's talking about is not necessarily the physical bringing people back from the dead or the physical bringing sight to people that didn't have it. Now, it could include that. Don't get me wrong here. It could include it. But the greater thing is not the physical. The greater things is the spiritual. So what would be better? To have a guy that had died and just bring him back to life or to show people the way of Yahuwah and have him gain eternal salvation? Well, it's the gaining the eternal salvation is much greater. So, you know, the bringing back to life or healing a disease or healing a sickness. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's good. Don't get me wrong. But to heal somebody from being dead in their in spiritually, not knowing Yahuwah, to being alive is much, much greater. Healing people from, okay, I'll, I'll give you this example. The leprosy is considered uh, sinful nature in the scripture. And so to heal somebody of leprosy would be to teach them to not sin and to have them sin no more. Okay. So when, you know, when you, when you heal people that are sick, when you give the sight to the blind, when you raise people from the dead, we've done all of that. Okay. Not from the physical stance standpoint, but from the spiritual standpoint, which is much greater. Okay. Verse 39. And, and we are witnesses of all things, which he did both in the land and, uh, in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed and hanged on a tree. Him, Elohim raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not, uh, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by Elohim, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify uh, that is uh, that it is he who has ordained was ordained by Yahuwah to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets uh, witnessed that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. Okay, now he said a lot here, but I want to I want to just you know I want to bring this out. You know, it says in 40, it says, whom Elohim raised on the third day and showed him openly. Now, you know, uh, I've had a lot of preachers tell me this, and, and I, I struggle with it, but I'm not going to say that it's wrong. But, you know, it says that, that we will be raised up in the final day. And a lot of the preachers have talked about, you know, the, looking at the cross or the crucifix and, and Yahushua hanging on the cross. Well, you know, and it says that, you know, that's our picture. Well, that's not the picture. I mean, we don't worship a dead Elohim or, you know, our Savior, our, our Messiah is not dead. Okay, here what it's saying is that after three days in the grave, he was raised up, meaning that he went from the earth back to the right hand of Yahuwah. That's the raising up that it's talking about, that we will be raised up in the final days. Okay, so that is the Messiah that I want to follow. I don't want to follow... A, a a dead guy hanging on a cross okay that's not that's not my messiah my messiah he went through that don't get me wrong but now he's alive and the 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 raising is the the important part of the raising is now he was he was raised from the dead back to yahuwah where he belongs and so uh it says that uh that okay so in the people that saw it these witnesses were chosen by Elohim. 
Now you can get into, you, you can start fights and arguments over predestination. You can do however you want to. All I'm telling you is what the scripture says. When it says that we were predestined, there's no doubt in my mind that's what it's talking about. Now, does it mean that, uh, that, that, you know, Yahuwah said no, that, you know, some people that can't, you know, can't ever be saved? Well, I'm sure that there's some, but we all have a choice. But the thing is, he sees the book from the beginning to the end. We are in the middle of the book. We all we can see is where we are right now and where we've been. And a lot of it, we don't even recognize where we've been. We, we forget a lot of that. But the thing is, he sees the front to the back. And he knows that who's going to be uh, obedient and who's not going to be obedient. So he knows. So the ones that he chose to be or to see this are the ones that he knows are going to be obedient. And so, and the ones that are, he knows that are not going to be obedient, then he knows that they're not, there's no need in them even understanding what's going on here. Okay. <clears throat> so it, but anyway, he's going to judge us. He's going to judge the living and the dead. Now the living and the dead, it's not just talking about your physical life or your physical death. It's talking about, are you spiritually alive or are you spiritually dead? And he's going to judge all of those. Okay. So anyway, uh, Okay, so while Peter was still speaking these words, the, the Ruach Kodesh fell upon all who heard the word. Now, I want to bring this out. The Ruach Kodesh will only fall on people that are in Yahuwah's word. In other words, if you're not, if you're not following or trying to follow the Torah, you might have a spirit, but it won't be the set apart spirit. It won't be the Kadosh spirit, the Holy Spirit. It will be a spirit. Don't get me wrong, but it will not be Yahuwah spirit. If it, if, because Yahuwah spirit will only fall on those that are keeping the Torah and have the faith in Yahushua the Messiah. That's the only way about it. There's no, there's no two ways to look at this. And if you're not, if you're teaching, if you're teaching lawlessness, in other words, if you're teaching or believing that you don't have to follow the Torah, then you have the spirit of the anti-Messiah or a false prophet as in Deuteronomy, I think it's 16. But anyway, so he's not going to put his spirit in those that are teaching false doctrine. All right. And, uh, it, and those who of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because of the gift of the Ruach Kodesh had the uh, spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also for they heard them speak with tongues and magnified Yahuwah. Now these that are there it, it's saying of the circumcision. Now it's specifically talking see when when it talks about the circumcision it's it depends on really how you're looking at this or how, who's actually talking about it. But when it says those of the circumcision, it's talking about the circumcision of the heart. It's not talking about the, the it's not talking about the circumcision of the flesh, which is the rabbinical, uh, the, you know, the teaching of the rabbis. So in, in the teaching of the rabbis, the physical circumcision is a sign of being in covenant. Well, we know that that doesn't matter because when Moses was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, they were in the desert 40 years and they never circumcised a male child any time during that, that trek, that 40 year trek. It had to happen after Joshua took them into the, the, the promised land. So the Moses understood the circumcision of the heart is what was important. And he knew that those that, that wanted to follow Yahuwah, had, you know, had the circumcision of the heart, like Joshua and Caleb, for instance. And there were some younger children that were born, you know, in that 40 years that also felt, you know, had the circumcision of the heart. But the ones that, that, that died, they were the ones that didn't want to go, they didn't want to follow Moses. They felt like they were being made to follow, and, they, and Moses made them follow the Torah. So, therefore, you know, their heart wasn't circumcised, okay? And, uh, so when here, these people, they had already been Torah obedient, so they understood the Torah, and now they're being told about Yahusha, Hamashiach, the Messiah, and now when that happens, now the scriptures, the scales fall off their eyes, and they start seeing the scripture for what it really means, 
okay? And until you have both of those, you're, you're going to be blinded. You can't, you can't see what the scripture actually means. The Ruach will not reveal it to you, okay? But once you have, you, once you know the Torah, you start learning the Torah, then it starts becoming alive to you and you start seeing what it really means. And so this is where, you know, those that already have been following the Torah, it's an easy transition to the understanding that Yahushua is the Messiah, because that's really all they have to do is they have to understand that Yahushua is the Messiah. Now, us coming from the other direction, we realize that, that Yahushua is the Messiah, but then now we're challenged with learning the Torah. And that's a little more, diff little bit more difficult, but it's no more, it, it's, it's no more difficult than what they had to go through in the beginning because they had to learn the Torah, you know, and so we do too. But so, so anyway, it, 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 in putting it all together, it's those that keep the commandments of Yahuwah and have the faith in Yahushua the Messiah. And, <clears throat> and so here, once you have that, then the Ruach, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells and teaches you what we're supposed to know and also has the responsibility to keep us in covenant if that's what we want to do if we want to be in covenant then the ruach will, will the ruach will will quicken us will let us know that we've sinned and then we stop and turn the other way so like we talked last night uh yahuwah takes the responsibility of us staying in covenant that's the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant, where before it was completely up to the person that wanted to be in covenant. And now if you want to be in covenant, you truly want to be there, then Yahuwah will take the responsibility and make sure you stay there. That's the whole big difference between the new and the old covenants. Again, he will, he, he quickens us. He lets us know that we're sinning. And if you truly want to be in covenant, then you'll stop doing what he, when you'll stop doing whatever that quickening is. Okay, now it goes on. It says, then Peter answered, can anyone uh, forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Ruach Kodesh just as we have? And he, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of uh, Yahusha. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So here they're being baptized. Now they've already been okay so you have to understand the in the in the hebrew mindset that they uh they go through a ritual cleaning every time they get uh ritually unclean and that baptizing or that ritual cleaning is a baptizing and the baptizing is a it's a Greek word, I think, or maybe a Latin word. I don't remember, but it, it's it's uh, but but the word, the Hebrew word, is mikvah, and a mikvah is where you get in a pool of water and you 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 cleanse by you dunk yourself, you go under, uh, you know, and and you ritually clean yourself. Okay, so here, uh, th it's this is what it's talking about. It says, "Can anyone forbid water that they should not be mikvah?" And okay, in other words, it's going through. The, the ritual cleaning. Now, the people that are that, that this is talking about are very familiar with the mikvah, the, the ritual cleaning, but they have to go through it again in the, in the name of Yahusha Hamashiach to pick up that part of it. In other words, they have already mikvahed according to the Torah, and now they're going to go and they're going to mikvah according to, you know, what Yahusha uh, called. So he, that's why that's that's why you see the different baptisms. You know, you see one where it talks about the baptism right here of Yahusha Hamashiach, or the baptism of the you know the the Father, the Son, and the Ruach Kodesh, which means that those that are coming into the belief system that haven't got anything, then they need to be baptized according you know according to that. Well, here, these are being baptized. They've already been baptized or already been mikvahed according to the Torah, the Father, and the, the Father. So here now, all they, what they, it's just, it's just their way of, of, of describing, you know, how they need to, to follow in their ritual cleaning and their baptizing. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the main thing that I wanted to go through here this morning. And so uh, 
understanding, again, I'm just going to recap, that this whole chapter in, in the book of Acts here, chapter 10, has nothing to do with food. And that's all that I've ever heard taught, you know, whenever I was in, in contemporary Christian religion, doctrine, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> that, uh, that, uh, that Yahuwah, that God made all things unclean and we can eat whatever we want. Well, we know that that's a violation of Torah. And if you go back and look, if you read in Isaiah chapter uh, 65 and 66, there are some pieces in there that talks about in the final days. And it's Isaiah, if you, if you, if, if you don't, if you don't believe Isaiah, what he's saying here, then you might as well just tear the whole chapter out and throw it away. Because what Isaiah says in 65 and 66 is that in the final days, people will be eating the flesh of swine and the flesh of mouse. And, and it's an abomination to Yahuwah. And so, I mean, Isaiah is speaking of the final days, talking about right now. And he's, he's looking at this, saying that it is, an, it is an abomination to Yahuwah. And so you can't throw that out because it's a prophecy about today, okay? And so if, you know, to, to go out and say that it's okay to eat this stuff, that, that Yahuwah said that it was okay, or Jesus said that it was okay, and Peter says it was okay, that's all false doctrine. It's all false teaching. It's, there's, it, it's lies. It's deception that's put out by the the uh, uh, the devil, and it's meant to lead people away from Yahuwah. <clears throat> the same thing is like we we had a study here the other night about the uh, uh, the Sabbath. Okay, now one thing you have to understand is in Yahuwah's looking at things, you have okay, so it's it's in Hebrew. But it's first day, second day, and I'm talking about days of the week. It's first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, Shabbat. Okay, Shabbat is not just a rest day. It is the seventh day, okay, which means that it's a, an appointment or an appointed time. So if you want to change the... the uh, the Shabbat from a Saturday to a Sunday, then go ahead. But it's not Yahuwah's Shabbat. It would be man's Shabbat. So are you going to be in man's religion or are you going to be in Yahuwah's religion? It's up to you. If you want to, now I'm, there's not anything wrong with worshiping on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you, you know, I, I think I might have got it. Let's change it from the seventh day to the first day, I guess, where I missed it. But anyway, long story short, if you want to change the Sabbath, then you're going to be worshiping in man's religion. It's not Yahuwah's religion. If you want to be worshiping in Yahuwah's religion, then the Saturday will be the, the day of your worship day will be Shabbat. Sunday, it's okay to worship, but it's not the Shabbat. Okay. And so <clears throat> if you go back and look, there's, I mean, there's actually, there's, there's Christian uh, writings that actually say that that's their way of showing authority by changing the Sabbath. And so we know that that's, you know, that it, it's, it's, it's a changing of the Sabbath. It's not, you know, that's man's doing. It's not man's. So you can't, man cannot take away anything from the scripture or add anything to the scripture. <clears throat> because if you do, then basically what, uh, Deuteronomy and Revelation, they both mention it. It talks about that if you add anything to it, then, then you know, you're, you better be following it exactly. Because if you're not following what you're teaching exactly, then you're going to be judged by it, even though it's wrong. And if you take it away, then it says, if you take part of it away, then whatever you take away, then your, your, your part of salvation will be taken away. So you don't add to, you don't take away anything in the scripture. OK, so, you know, when you when you go to changing things, then you're you're walking on really thin ice and you're fixing to fall into the, the frigid water because you who's not going to he's not going to stand for it. So it's his way of doing things. And, and I want to kind of I want to move a little bit in this direction right quick. So, you know, people talk about, you know, the law uh, 
being a curse. Well, the law is not a curse. The curse of the law, if you want to go back and look at the curse of the law, the curse of the law is that you must die. And that's in Deuteronomy 27, uh, uh, let's see, is it Deuteronomy? It's 37, 38, and 39, I believe. And so, I mean, I'm going to make sure I want to give you that right because uh, I don't, that's, that's important. Let's see. Uh, it's, okay, it's going to be uh, Deuteronomy 28 is going to be the, yeah. Okay, so blessings on uh, obedience and then uh, 28 and 29, and then there's curses for disobedience. Okay, when it's talking about the blessings and the curses, when it talks about the curse of the law, it's not talking about the law itself. It's talking about the curse. And it, if you read this on, on, uh, on sins that are uh, intentional, then you must die. Well, Yahusha died for that. So we don't have to die anymore. All right. That's the curse of the law. That's what he took away. And I want you to understand this. And I've, I've talked about this before, but this is vitally important that you understand this. To call the law a curse is actually blasphemy because what you're calling a curse is the heart, soul, and mind of Yahuwah. Whenever Moses came off the mountain with the law, this law was his instructions for us to live by, which means that had he not came off the mountain with this law, we had no way of salvation because we have no way of knowing what he requires. Okay, this was one of the greatest gifts that he could have ever given us was his instructions to live by so that we could, so we could be in fellowship with him. If you call the law a curse, then you are blaspheming Yahuwah because you're saying that he and his instructions and his ways are a curse. So I'm going to warn you, be extra careful in, in, in looking at the law and, and describing to people about the law. If you read Jeremiah 23, it says that Yahuwah will, he will destroy you and put you away forever for saying that his law is a burden, that his Torah is a burden. Also in uh, 1 John 5, 2, it says that this is how we know that we know him, is that we keep his commandments because it's not hard to do. So uh, again, following his commandments and his statutes and his judgments are his heart, soul, and mind given to us so that we can come to know him. And otherwise we could not know him. There's no way. We'd be chasing all kind of Elohims out there, not having any clue about who he really is. He tells us in his word, his name. His name in the original Hebrew scripture is in there over 6,800 times. His name is in there. And I'm talking about one name, Yahuwah. That doesn't count all the, the El Shaddai or El Elyon, or uh, Yah Yahuwah Nisi, or Yahuwah, you know, all these other names that, that are in there. These, all these other names, all they are is attributes of Yahuwah. But his name, the yod Hey wah Hey, Yahuwah, that name is in there over 6,800 times. Nobody knows it. I've never been taught that, <laughs> never. And so anywhere you see the word, the Lord, right here. That right there has been retranslated to the Lord, but it's actually, if you go to the original Hebrew, it is yod Hey wah Hey. It is Yahuwah. And again, it's in there over 6,800 times. Now, would he have put his name in, a, in instructions to man about how to follow him and given his name 6,800 times and him not want us to know his name. I mean, that makes absolutely no sense. So we are, we are supposed to know his name, regardless of what anybody teaches you or tells you, but we are supposed to use it very reverently. We are not to just flippantly use his name or use it in a derogatory way. 
We are to, uh, uh, to uh, respect that name above all names, okay? But his name, Yahuwah, is in the scripture over eight, uh, 6,800 times. And so that is the gift that he has given us. And that gift is the mag most magnificent gift he could ever give. But he up one on us when he sent Yahusha, which was the living Torah, to come and be our salvation. Yahusha, meaning Yahuwah saves. It's two Hebrew words, Yahu, Sha. Yahu is Yahuwah, Sha is salvation or saves. Yahuwah saves, Yahusha. Okay, so he, uh, when he sent Yahusha, then he fulfilled the prophecies in the, uh, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, where, you know, all about Yahusha and Yahusha came and delivered his message to us. But, it, it, but the most important thing that he did is he set the captives free. He let the people that were in the nation of Israel were lost forever because in Jeremiah chapter three, Yahuwah divorced them with no way of salvation. So Yahusha had to come and die on the cross because the husband had to die. Otherwise the, the bride or the wife could never be reunited. And now it, when he died, according to Torah, it freed up the wife to be remarried. And now they can be reunited back to Yahuwah, just like the nation of uh, well, the, the tribes of Judah and Levi and Benjamin. So, and more than likely, all of us that are listening to this video are probably of that lost 10 tribes or have descendants of that lost 10 tribes. And what Yahusha did was made it a way for us to come back. Otherwise, we could have never come back. Okay. So, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and... Uh, uh, we're almost an hour into this and I don't want to go much longer because I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to give people too much uh, information because I want, uh, the, the main thing is that we learn this, okay? And I, I'll just open it up. Do y'all, anybody have any, any questions or comments or anything? I was just thinking, you know. Okay, speak up. So. Like, it just kind of shows how we're sheep uh, listening to whatever the preacher says about um, the food. Yeah. You know, because if you keep on reading, it tells us exactly what the dream is about. That's right. And so, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so, you know, we're taught to, uh, to follow what the preacher says. Well, the problem is the preacher is following what he was taught, not what he, see, they're not, they're not going into the scripture and studying the scripture. That's the problem. They're just, they're going on what they were taught. And then, but here, but here's the, here's the really weird thing about the brain, how our human brain works. When we're taught something to be the truth, when we see something that doesn't line up with that truth, we tend to rationalize it or we tend to, to either overlook it or try to make it fit what we already believe. And that's just the way the human mind works. Well, that those preachers, they were taught that the law was done away with, that we don't have to follow the dietary instructions or anything like that. So when they read that, they don't see it. And, and you can say however you want to say this, but in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that those that choose to believe the lie, that Yahuwah will send them a strong delusion to continue to believe the lie. Well, okay, so they want to believe what their preachers told them. So they're sent the strong delusion to continue to believe that lie. And in that strong delusion, Yahuwah will allow your prayers to be answered. He will allow you to, I mean, if you want, if you want to be in the prosperity movement, he'll, he'll allow you to get rich. And because what that does, it just, it just builds on what you want to believe. And you continue to believe and you say, well, I've got to be doing the right thing because God is, uh, he's blessing me in this. Well, no, he's giving you what you want. That's what he's doing. He's being merciful and he's giving you what you want. But what he wants is not that. He wants you to turn to him. Okay. So, but, so that 
Second Thessalonians chapter two, where it talks about he will send us a strong delusion to continue to believe the lie. That's what it's about. So in other words, he's not going to throw a stumbling block in front of you and get you to turn back to him unless he knows that you're going to be one of his. And then he'll do whatever it takes. He'll take you to the bottom, to rock bottom, and you'll be down there floundering like a fish out of water. And the only way you want to turn is back to him. And he'll do that, you know, if, if he knows that you're going to be one of his. But otherwise, he'll give you whatever you want. If you don't want to follow him, then he'll help you not follow him. But he knows, he knows who we are. He knows if we want to truly follow him, then he'll make a way that we can find him. If we don't want to follow him, that we want to just follow our own way, our man-made religion and, and all that kind of stuff, then he'll help us do that too. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I really appreciate all the uh, that are here and also the ones that are that are coming in and, and listening to the video on YouTube. And uh, again, I just, I want to thank you. And, and uh, you know, I just, all, all, all we're interested in, we're not interested in, in you know, uh, uh, you know, any monetary gain. We're not interested in anything that we, you know, uh, all we're interested in is that Yahuwah be lifted up and people come to know the truth about Yahuwah. So let's go to Yahuwah in prayer and we'll close this meeting out. Father Yahuwah, we thank you again for all that you do. We thank you for the many blessings that you give us. And Father, we just thank you for this word. And Father, it's just magnificent and, and astounding how you do things. And you can hide things in plain sight where those that don't want to see it won't see it. And those that do want to see it will see it. Just like Peter's vision. Those that don't want to see it, that don't want to know the truth, they will never see it. Those that do want to know the truth, you show us, show it to us. And Father, I just want to thank you for that. I, I just praise you because your ways are so much greater than ours. Your ways are so magnificent compared to ours. We could have never thought of things that, that you do that you show us in scripture. Man could have never done that. Father, we thank you for taking control of the new covenant, for putting your Ruach in us. And Father, we will try the best we can to be in obedience to what you ask us and what you tell us to do. And Father, we just ask that you continue to work in our hearts and our lives and help us to be obedient. Because without you, there's no way that we could be obedient. Father, again, we praise you, we thank you, we love you, and we just ask that you continue to watch over and protect us. All this we ask and pray in Yahushua's name. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Bless her. 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 Bless her.